when someone rubs their hands together, what does that suggest? Happy. Sorry? Happy. It suggests that you're ready, yes? I'm ready, brothers and sisters. Amen. I'm ready. The message for this morning is entitled, Where Have the Standards Gone? Where have the standards gone? But before I start, I'd just like to also join my prayers with Maxine as she highlighted um, about Joshua's father being unwell and also Cresswell being able to move to new offices. Um, Giles and the way that he has ministered to the new place that the Lord has caused and opened up for him. Um, there was also a young girl, I couldn't see her face because he was very short, she highlighted about her mother's going to have a baby. Amen? Amen? And she wants to make sure that everything is in order. Brothers and sisters, there are so many things that are happening in this world today. And we need to ensure that we are on the Lord's side. Amen. Because there are only two sides. There is no gray area. There is no middle ground. It's your for Christ or you would be against him automatically by default. So we want to ensure that the standards that the Lord has set in place are the standards that we will keep and remember and share with others that come along the way. You know, when we um, were growing up, we were told certain things and we were reminded how to behave when we're in church and so forth. And, and I remember a time when I was sitting a little bit towards the back of church and I was with my friends and, um, you know, as young people do, <laughs> you start chatting and you talk a little bit and it always starts with a little conversation. You're right. Yeah. How about you? Yeah. And before you know it, that small conversation that was a whisper is full blown and the projection of the voice, people are going, can you be quiet please? Can you be quiet please? And your conversation alters from being somewhat spiritual to move into the secular. And I remember I was in this circumstance and my mother was sitting on the platform because she was part of the choir. And she says, by a look, you best behave yourself. One look was sufficient. My friends were trying to talk to me and my face was like this <laughs> because I knew what the standard was. Let us bow our heads as we ask the Lord to be with us. Merciful Father, great God of heaven and earth, we bow our heads before you, looking for inspiration and guidance in our life. We have no power, Heavenly Father, but the power that you've offered unto us. So hear us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The scripture reading highlighted that as we are God's people, we will go through persecution. But prior to that, it highlights that in 2 Timothy 3, it says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. We will go through times of persecution. We will go through issues at work, at home, at school, even on the streets and the buses. 
that may cause our faith to be tested. Has you, have you ever been on the bus and the bus is full and somebody is looking for a seat and everybody wants to sit down? But an elderly lady comes on the bus and it is the norm if you're a young man, amen, or an older man, as long as you are able to get up and let some young, some lady have that seat. Yes? Yes. Now, when you see the reverse, what would you then suggest? When you see an elderly lady getting up and saying, it's okay, you can sit here, son. You start to think, well, um, no, it's okay, you can sit down. No, it's all right, I'm getting off at the next stop. The standard slightly starts to shift. The Bible tells us that we will go through difficult times. At work, you will be asked to come in on Sabbath. You will be asked to do things and behave a certain way which affect your spirituality and your standard in faith. People will say to you, the rest of the team is doing this. Why is it that you don't fit in? Are you better than everybody else? There will be a loud cry sooner or later. There will be an opportunity for us to share our faith in such a way that it will be our downfall in a good way. Because if you stick to the standards, you will stick out like a sore thumb. Yes? People will wonder, you know what, I can understand your belief, but, you know, the world doesn't operate that way. And the Bible has already told us that we are not to be in the world. No, we are to be in the world, but not of the world. If you turn with me to Mark 1... highlights how John the Baptist had been the forerunner for Jesus Christ and it was his turn to demise his turn to demonstrate that his time is now coming towards an end so he should decrease and Christ should increase so he then goes on to say behold to the, his disciples behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. And if you look through the discourse in Mark 1, Jesus is baptized of John. And as Jesus is baptized, he then goes into the wilderness. And in the wilderness, he is tormented. And you know how when we are agitated and feel uncomfortable, it's normally when you're at your weakest point, does the usurper of this world, the devil, will come and tempt you. He'll come and cause problems for you. So here Jesus is in the wilderness and the devil comes and says, command that the stones be made bread. Do you realize that hunger, or let's say food, is going to be one of the main reasons why people will be lost? Food. If we can overcome that you can overcome most anything. Because when you're hungry, people turn different. Their personality changes. They are not the same person when everything is running smoothly. Food, a commodity that can really have a direct impact on your spirituality. But Jesus did not fail. He moved away from that. And then he started to go to the synagogues and to preach. And if you read with me in Mark 1 verse 9, and it reads, and it, and it came to pass that in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. 
And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened. And the Spirit, like a dove, descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Many a time there's been this misunderstanding, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Clearly here, we can see the three all together. The Spirit as a dove. Jesus immersed in the water. And the voice from heaven, God, demonstrating, this is my beloved Son. Jesus' mission was to save people. In many cases, um, people would say, well, is he come to save me? Can Jesus save me? Jesus is the creator of this world. God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three in one that can do things that we could never imagine. So we need to make ensure that we look to um, Jesus who is the author and finisher of our faith. And then it continues on. Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw John, sorry, Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting their nets into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And that was verse 16. If you keep it within Mark 1, you won't go far wrong. Verse 16 and 17. And you see how here Christ was a significant teacher? He said, if you follow me, I will make you fishers of men. You know, sometimes when we try to communicate with people, we use a language that they do not understand. See, Jesus said, fishers of men. He didn't say, I'll make you pastor. He didn't say, I'll make you an evangelist. Because maybe they would think, an evangelist? What's one of those? Pastor? I've never heard of that term. But a fisher of men? Yeah, I can understand that. Because I'm collecting fish in my net. But now when I'm going out and I'm ministering to people, I can draw them to Christ. So the terminology is, ex is significant when Jesus called them fishers of men. And then a little further on, and Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you fishers of men. And straightway they followed and forsook their nets and followed him. But a little further on, Zebedee, James and John's father. You can just imagine it was probably in a good or short location. They too followed Christ. So in a short space of time, there was Andrew and Simon, James and John. Those were the first four of the disciples that Christ spoke to and that they followed. But as Christ is doing his spiritual work, teaching and sharing, he then goes into the synagogue. And the Bible tells us at verse 23, and there was in the synagogue a man that was unclean, with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art the Holy One of God. Even the demons knew who Jesus was. Possession is a very serious thing, brothers and sisters. And when I say possession, I'm talking about demon possession. When they take over the body of an individual, that individual is not themselves. And clearly here the Bible is saying that this individual was taken over and it was the spirit or the demon that started speaking to Christ. The good thing about Christ is he told the demon to be still. 
demonstrating that he has power over all things. Remember, he's setting a standard here. His disciples, Andrew, Simon, John, are all here. And they are seeing what is happening. And Jesus is demonstrating power over evil spirits. So he says, hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him, he cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him power from Jesus Christ but even still we continue on in the verses and we see how the scribes were also teaching in the synagogue but Jesus taught with conviction he taught with power and people were listening to his words nowadays when we talk brothers and sisters when you talk about Christ don't be afraid don't feel that you don't have any power. Even though you may appear weak in Christ, you are indeed very strong. Because you're not using your frailties, you're not using your sinfulness. You are tapping in to a power that only Jesus can give. So don't feel afraid. Stand for Christ. The Bible says in verse 28, and immediately the fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. And forthwith, when they came out of the synagogue, they entered into a house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Simon and Andrew's mother-in-law, Simon's mother-in-law, was unwell. And you can just imagine Jesus had just finished preaching and he wanted to minister elsewhere. And as any woman would have it, if somebody is coming to their house, they'd like to prepare. Even if it is a cup of water. And you could just imagine that Simon's mother-in-law is unwell and laid on the bed. But what did Jesus do, brothers and sisters? He didn't think, you know what, she'll be okay a few days and she'll be well. He raised her up and immediately, the Bible says, she started to minister unto them. Again, the Lord is setting the standard. He has power over evil spirits. He has power over sickness and disease. We serve a mighty God. Yes? The same things that the Lord did then he can do now Amen. if we believe so the Bible continues on and it says and he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up by the hand and lifted and immediately the fever left her and she ministered unto them you can just imagine also at this time when people were hearing that Jesus was healing sick and you know casting out demons people from everywhere started to come because you know if my mother was unwell and she had either cancer alzheimer's diabetes i wouldn't think whether i should go and get her or not yeah i'd be there saying mom i know somebody who can save you this is jesus the son of god walk this way so that I can take you there. So I would put her in the vehicle and bring her to Jesus. So you can just imagine here when it says, and that evening when the sun did set, they brought unto, all, unto him all that were diseased and them that were possessed with devils. All brothers and sisters, not some. Because Jesus has a power that sometimes we don't tap into properly. We assume that I'll do this, I'll do this part, and I'll let Jesus do the rest. Jesus caters for all things, as long as we put our trust in him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. And he said unto them, Let us go into an, the next town, that I may preach there also, for there came I forth. 
And he preached in the synagogues throughout all Galilee and cast out devils. The Bible then goes on and says in verse 40 that there was also a leper. Now I'm not sure if you know a little bit about leprosy, but it oozes a pus. And that is on the body of an individual. Their flesh starts to rot to the extent that limbs may fall off. There is also an odour that is so... not very nice. That people will shun you. People won't want to speak with you. They will make you feel so uncomfortable you would find yourself staying away from church staying away from family but the bible tells us here that that leper came to jesus you know when you're sick and you're able to move come to jesus because if they don't come to you because they you're at home or you're you're hidden yourself sometimes people won't even know that you're unwell but come to jesus and jesus will heal you and in the same way he said to the leper i will make you clean. Be thou clean. The Bible then tells us that as soon as he had spoken immediately, the leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed. I believe Jesus can clean us up. He can purify our minds. He can ensure that we are ready for salvation. To have a knowledge of what Jesus can do and who he is, we need to know who Christ is linked to. We also need to know who God is. So, like our Saviour, we are in this world to do service for God. We are here to become like God in character and by a life of service to reveal him to the world. In order to be co-workers with God, in order to become like him and to reveal his character, we must know him aright. We must know him as he reveals himself. A knowledge of God is the foundation of all true education and of all true service. No when we are serving God, we need to serve God his way. If we serve God a different way, then Truthfully, we're not serving God. We are doing our own thing. This is the knowledge needed by all who are working for the upliftment, uplift, uplifting of their fellow men. Transformation of character, purity of life, efficiency in service, adherence to correct knowledge and principles is the essential preparation both for this life and for the life to come. If we are doing for things for Christ, here in this world, we are indirectly preparing ourselves for heaven. Amen. Do you understand that? Amen. You see, when you're helping your brother and your sister, you may just think you're helping your brother and sister, but you're refining your character. You are gradually, bit by bit, day by day, becoming like Christ. If someone was to say, are you perfect? How many hands would go up? None. Because we know we're not perfect. And you know what? It's just the way the truth is. But if we stay close to Christ, Christ will see something in us that we will not and cannot see because we are starting to be transformed by him. Through a knowledge of him are given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. You know, sometimes our education that the world gives allows us to feel that we have arrived. I have all my degrees, one, two, and three. I'm now going for the PhD. We, with our education, can feel or elevate ourselves over other people. I remember it 
We are all God's people. We are all God's children. And as we work together, ministering unto each other, we are doing service for God. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glory, glorieth, glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. And that's taken from Jeremiah 9, verse 23 and 24. Just to share a small caption from the Ministry of Healing. It reads, the things of nature that, are now, that we now behold give us but a faint conception of Eden's glory. Can you imagine Eden? No. Can you imagine the water, the greenery, the mountains, the plush green grass? You know, if you was to close your eyes and try to imagine it, you, you couldn't imagine it enough. You would probably try and link it with a place that you know of. And I remember um, a number of years ago, we went to Jamaica with my family. And we went to a place called Dunn's River. I'm not sure if anyone knows of Dunn's River. And Dunn, yes, Maxine, as yes, Ms. <laughs> thank you. And Dunn's River is a waterfall. And you could actually walk down it and walk back up. So you could enjoy the refreshing water. And I thought that was quite nice because in the UK, um, I haven't seen anything of that nature. And there may probably be, but when we went to Jamaica, that was one of the sights to go and see. So we all went there and we enjoyed it and we, um, we spent a lot of time there. We spent, I believe, the entire day. And that could remind me of how Eden could possibly be. It was beautiful. And there were many people wanting to enjoy the sights. I then also had an opportunity to go to Zimbabwe um, as a missionary to build a church in 1989. And 40 of us went to a place called um, Zambia and we saw some of the facts, the, the circumstances and the, the niceties of that place but we also went to a place called Victoria Falls may the Lord have mercy Victoria Falls I thought I was in heaven it was so beautiful it's so picturesque that you know what you could nearly you could stay there if you could just build your house on the edge that would be heaven and it just reminded me that we are God's people where he's preparing us a place which outdo this Duns River and Victoria Falls we are going to a place that there is peace tranquility no more sickness, no more dying, no more problems, because Jesus will be there. And it just gives us the understanding that if we stay faithful, if we stay focused, we can get those blessings and those benefits. From the solemn roll of the deep-toned thunder and old ocean ceaseless roar, that the glad songs that make the forest vocal and melody Nature's 10,000 voices speak his praise in earth and the sea and the sky with their marvelous tint and color varying in gorgeous contrast or blended in harmony. We behold his glory. This is God's glory. But remember, Jesus on earth set the standard. By setting the standard, we know where the benchmark is. Um, um, 
As long as it's, is it okay if I just use this one for now, because then I can turn and... The word moral, Angela told a story this morning. And deep in the story, or should you, I say the epicenter, the middle part of the story, is to demonstrate the moral. And the moral demonstrates high, um, specifically the benefits the advantages and different disadvantages. It shows the wrong and right behavior within the moral. So when we have a moral of a story, we always tend to flesh it out and try to determine what was good about it, what wasn't good about it. But here, we have found that the definition of moral is to highlight that your behavior, as long as it is good behavior, are we hearing? As long as your behavior is good behavior, there is a certain moral, there is a certain level of truth, of standard that is set. So within your story, young people, little ones, sometimes we need to think, oh, what is Angela trying to say in that story? Ah, oh, I know what the moral is. And then when the moral is found, you know exactly what is being said. Because that is the standard. If a man goes to a shop and he picks up some sweets and he goes out of the shop, what has he done? He has taken those sweets. They do not belong to him. He really shouldn't have done that. So the moral is, thou shall not steal. Now let's just imagine his son is with him. Big problem. Because his son sees his dad pick the sweets up, put it in his pocket and leave. And the son is thinking, Dad, um, we haven't paid for those yet. There is a standard. There is a moral. Now, for those builders, those who do a lot of um, brickwork and so forth and so on, the plumb line. And if, it, if you just read, it says... A, a cord from which a metal weight is suspended pointing directly to the earth's center or gr of gravity used to determine the vertical from a given point perpendicular. Now, you cannot see the string, but on that weight would be a string. And that string would ensure that that line is straight. Imagine if you were building a wall and you decided to not use your plumb line. Your wall would do things that you wouldn't want it to do. Your wall would be slightly crooked, then come back into, into its plumb line, and then go back off to a different standard. So it's important that we keep to the standard. The world has standards, yes? The world wants to ensure that things run right. If you decided to drive your car on the wrong side of road, then there would be problems. Significant ones, but there would be problems. Benchmark is also another one. The benchmark is the standard of which all things measure up to. Benchmark. And then there's a little example. It says, the pay settlements will set a benchmark for other employers and workers. So if the employer decides to pay you X amount, everyone else that comes in at your level this is what they would get, the benchmark. Now that benchmark doesn't have to just be with salary. It could be with the standards at home. It could be the standards when you go someplace, the way you dress, your deportment. If you set a standard, people would expect a certain thing. I wanted to share something also with our young people. Um, Maxine highlighted that we need to pray for our young people. And if we pray for our young people, 
they will gain strength, brothers and sisters. They will get power from on high. If we don't pray for them, then when they go off the rail, leave them alone. <laughs> because you need to ensure that you are bathing them in spiritual prayers. You are asking the Lord to cover them with his robe of righteousness, with his Holy Spirit, giving them an opportunity to come to Christ. They may not always get the opportunity to come to church, but if they are in Christ, Christ will transform their life. Young people desire companionship. And just in proportion to the strength with which their feelings and affections are fastened upon those with whom they associate. So these associations will be the power of those friends to be either a blessing or a curse to them. Now that's strong words. Because the people that our young people associate with could either lift them up spiritually or bring them down. So as parents also, we need to be vigilant to who our young people mingle with. Would you agree? We have a responsibility to ensure that our young people are fine. If my son came in one day and he, he looked a certain way and I didn't pick up on the signals, he could go to sleep, get up in the morning and he'll be fine. And then I wouldn't have known what happened the previous day. Now because it wasn't dealt with, it may happen again later on. Then I would see the same disposition and not address it and things could be going on in his life or their life and I would be totally divorced to it. Our job as parents is to talk with our children. When you're talking with your children you're getting to know them, you're bonding with them, you're spending good quality time, you'll cry sometimes and you might have to tell them off, amen? amen. There's nothing wrong we're telling off your children when they're wrong. Because if you didn't tell them off, they would, in many years later on, say, well, you didn't say anything, Dad. You didn't say anything, Mom. So how can you be telling me now? We have a responsibility to teach and train our young ones. So here, ensure that their associations are wholesome. Then let parents be aware let them guard every influence of association. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. He that walketh with fools shall be destroyed. Psalm, sorry, Proverbs 13, verse 20. The only safe course for the youth is to mingle with the pure, the holy, and thus natural tendencies to do evil will be held in check. Yeah? By beholding, we become changed. You mingle with the wrong things, wrong temperament, it will have a, an effect on you. Satan is seeking to imbue every soul that is connected with Jesus Christ with his own spirit. And every soul who refuses to connect with Jesus Christ will be brought into connection with the enemy of Christ. There are threads of influence leading out from these souls to bind and draw other souls by human influence until they shall be placed under the control of Satan and their feet be led into false paths. Let us not forget that in the garden when Eve took of the fruit who spoke to her in such a way using as it were they say a silver tongue to win her over and then causing her to bring her husband in. We need to ensure that if we're away from the devil, he can't <coughs> distract our lives, as long as we are away from him. Let all who would form a, char a right character choose associates <coughs> who are of a serious, thoughtful turn of mind and who are religiously inclined. Now, brothers and sisters, sometimes we might think that it's, we have to only have Seventh-day Adventist friends. 
That's not what I'm saying, and that's not the case. We need to be in the world, but not of the world. You can have as many friends, non-SDA, as you choose. But you must also remember that by beholding, you become changed. Yes? It just, it's just the way things are. If somebody is good at stealing, I'll use that before, I'll use it again, and you spend a lot of time with them, sooner or later they'll tell, start to tell you, you know what, I actually take cars too. You do what? I can get cars cheap. I'll show you how to get in. And before you, you think, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I don't do things like that, you may start that way. But gradually, in time, they may say, you don't have to do anything, just stand over there and watch me. Do you hear me? And as you stand over there and you watch, you're looking, you're seeing the technique. <laughs> and maybe one day you think, well, let me just try it and see what happens. And it's normally the person who is not fully trained, doesn't have a clue, that gets caught out. And they find themselves incarcerated and they then do not know what to do. Stay with Jesus. You are safer with Jesus Christ. Because standards demonstrate how things are supposed to be, we have to be mindful of how they creep in to the church. Now, I'm not sure if you know the gentleman called Joe Cruz, he wrote this Creeping Compromise, and he highlighted how some of these things can find themselves into church. This is the way compromise has always slipped into the church. Satan introduces an activity which is only slightly objectionable. In fact, it might be very hard to define exactly why the action isn't good. And because the deviation is so tiny, no one really wants to make it an issue, make an issue over it. Some faithful members of the church feel uncomfortable about the matter, but are reluctant to say anything for fear of being called fanatical. They decide to wait until there is a larger issue before they take a strong stand. I see that talking to the seasoned members of the church. The seasoned members. The members who know more than those who are gradually coming into church. Because they know the standards, yes? That's why parents are there to support their children. If your children started supporting the parents, the parents will then think, well, who's the parent here? And they lose their credibility, their integrity sometimes. So it's important that we look and see when standards start to diminish that we hold a banner high as God's people. And just once, just one more. What do we have here? The Ten Commandments. And this is the standard of all standards. This is how we can ensure that we stay in the middle of the road. Now, it's very easy to move outside of the middle of the road if you don't look to what is right and true. So it says here, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The Hebrew boys, they knew not to bow down. Yes? They knew from way back because they knew what the standard was. If Nebuchadnezzar said, right, that's it. When you hear the music, I want everyone to bow down and that is it. Because they knew what was right and that the Bible says and that the law says, do not bow down to any other gods. They knew to stand straight. And you could just imagine on that plain of Jerusalem where there were so many people bowing down and those would be tugging them, just saying, just bow down for now. And then later on, you know that what you believe is what you believe. No. Standing firm. So they stood there. 
And you could just imagine the Nebuchadnezzar thinking, well, who dare oppose me? I am king. But yet, they found themselves in the fiery furnace because of their faith, because of the standard. But who also was with them? Jesus was in the fiery furnace. And was any hair of their head burned? No. We serve a God that takes care of his own. But you, if you look at that discourse, brothers and sisters, you will even know that they said, even if we are not to be saved, we will still not bow down. Because they were not careful how they answered Nebuchadnezzar. Not that they were being rude, but they stood for what was right and what was true. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. And nowadays that happens quite frequently. People in their conversation, in their speech, it's, it's like secondary language. They have to swear. They have to demonstrate some type of profanity. And on many occasions, I've spoken to people and I've said, you know, can you not swear? And they would say, oh, did I? Because it's just a part of their makeup now. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. The Lord has set the standards. Let us maintain what the Lord has put in place. Amen. Amen.